what's up guys and welcome back to mild versus the movies week number nine this is the ninth week of my film a day challenge for 2019 i'm beginning to go slightly mad we're gonna just jump straight in this week because i don't think i have any housekeeping stuff i want to talk about i've got my house shark pool but i'm gonna leave that for a wee bit and You'll, you'll know when I've decided where to make a video or not when the video appears on the channel and you'll be like, ah, you made the House Shark video, I see. We're going to jump into our first movie this week. So on Sunday, I watched Get Out on DVD, directed by Jordan Peele from 2017. For our plot summary, we follow Chris, an African-American man, goes with his girlfriend to stay at her parents' house. They're Caucasian. We follow him as his uneasiness grows. Again, very light on the actual plot my summaries i like i like it kind of being a like a sentence you'd get on the tv guide that's what i kind of go for because this is kind of like i kind of want you to go and watch the movies if you fancy them i don't want to spoil stuff for people because i'm hoping you might hear something and be like wow i want to go and see liam neeson's snowplow movie 2019 for example that's right i'm his back <laughs> Anyway, on to the pros for this movie. Firstly, I think the story is really good. Really interesting story. It's quite... I say quite. It's very well presented. It's... Well told is maybe more what I'm going for. It's quite interesting. It's quite engaging. It's got quite a good message. As my second pro, I thought this was a really good, nice slow burn horror now i've mentioned this whenever i've covered horror stuff previously i hate hate jump scare fawn horror movies where it's like oh it's a spooky asylum oh no man jumped out of the closet in front of me ah oh. and then oh no i've turned around the corner and there's a cat ah oh. so is a cat who knows that Whenever it's like a fake out jump scare, like 80% of them are cats. But this movie isn't like that. I don't think Get Out actually has any jump scares. I don't really remember them. If they are, they're not, you know, they're obviously not a huge part of the movie. Instead, we're all about atmosphere, like a creeping sense of uncertainty, just like a kind of slow drip of something not being right. And that's really good. I like that more than, because that... I was gonna say it takes a lot more talent. It's quite easy to just stand in a dark room and go boo and add on that violin sting that's in all those movies. Hate that violin sting, you know the hate it. But this movie isn't like that, and that made me really like it. Thirdly, I think Daniel Kaluuya's performance is really great in this. He is a really good actor, and he's really good in this. He does a uh, he's got quite a lot to do in it. He's got quite a lot of bits that are probably quite hard to act and he nails them he's really he's really good i liked him from other stuff beforehand as well it's kind of funny actually because you go from seeing him in like obscure brit well uh, say obscure obscure to a global audience british tv shows and he's in like black mirror and then he's in like get out I'm like good i'm glad people appreciate how good he is because he is he's really good for my next bro, I think the whole cast is great. It's a really good ensemble of people in this movie. In particular, for I mentioned Daniel Kaluuya. I also want to mention Alison Williams, who plays Rose. Uh, Chris, our main character, that's his girlfriend. She is amazing in it. She's really great. For my last bro, I kind of already mentioned it, but this movie is really tense. And I don't like any movie with good tension in it. Tension is one of the things I I really like in a movie, and this movie does it really well. No cons for Get Out, and I'm going to do it. For an overall rating, I'm going to give Get Out 10 out of 10. It's really good. I really enjoyed it. Do I think you should see it? Yes. It's really good, and you should go out your way to see it. From dizzying heights to terrifying lows, we move on to our next movie which is Hot Tub Time Machine, which I watched on DVD, directed by Steve Pink from 2010. For a plot summary, four friends travel back in time 
in a hot tub time machine to their youth in the 80s. For my pros of hot tub time machine, this film made me laugh once. I'm pretty sure it was a bit in the trailer where Craig Robinson says the name drop of the movie. He goes, this guess this is some sort of hot tub time machine. And then he turns and looks in the camera for two seconds and I was like, hey, that's a funny joke. Moving swiftly on to the cons now. <laughs> for my first con, I don't think this film's funny at all. The jokes are mostly that kind of American pie humour where it's like, Ew, gross, that's crude. Oh, oh, sex, am I right? Oh, it's just not funny. <laughs> I've never liked that type of humour and this movie's just that for, God, I can't remember how long it was. 90 minutes, hopefully? How much of my life did I waste on Hot Tub Time Machine? 99 minutes. Oh, it was really bad. I hated it. For my second con, I think the characters are very unlikable in this. I wrote down kinda. I regret writing kinda. I think they're very unlikable. In particular, one called Lou, who is like a party animal guy. He is one of the least likable characters I've ever seen in a movie and he's meant to be our protagonist. He's the one that things work out for the best in the end. And you're like, oh wow, good for him, I guess. He's very unlikable. He's just an asshole. One of my main problems with him, but he's mean-spirited. One of my main problems with him is he spends the vast majority of this movie waiting for a character to get his arm brutally ripped off. And that's like a running gag. And it's so... It's not done in like a... You could probably do that joke and have it be funny. Because they meet a character in the present day, he's got one arm, and then they go back in time and he's got both. So he's like, oh, he's going to lose the arm. For Somehow he knows it's going to be in the 80s. Somehow. I don't think it's ever established why he knows it will be that time. He just decides it. And he's really, really grossly into it. And it's kind of... It kind of crosses the line into being, like, really malicious and almost, like, unsavoury. It's... Ugh. I, I genuinely didn't like that character in this movie at all. And lastly, I've got the bad performances in this. John Cusack is in this movie, and he produced it. And he looks like he doesn't want to be in this movie he produced, which I don't blame him for. And the whole time, he's just doing this sort of Chevy Chase impression. Where he's trying to be like a jerk that's like likeable, but he's just a jerk. And then you've got Chevy Chase in the movie, and he's being an asshole. I'm like, why is... just why? Just why? That's my opinion of Hot Tub Time Machine, why? Well, they fought the title, and they went, that's funny. And the problem is, they didn't write any jokes to go with the rest of it. Well, they did, and they're all like, you know, Oh my god, that guy's gonna puke. Oh, he puked. Oh, that's funny. And he puked on his mum's face. Oh my god. I hate movies like this. So I give this movie a 1 out of 10. Do I think you should see it? No. Not even as a meme. Not even as a haha <laughs> hot tub time machine. Haha, <laughs> that's funny. No, it's not funny. I hated this movie. There's one joke that's funny in the entire... That made me laugh in the whole movie. In the whole movie. And it was in the trailer. Moving on from hot tub time machine. On Tuesday the 26th, I watched... Hellboy 2, The Golden Army on Netflix, directed by Guillermo del Toro from 2008. For a plot summary in this sequel, the titular Hellboy must stop an elvish prince's attempt to resurrect a dormant army to wage war on mankind. For my pros, firstly, amazing effects. This movie, the CGI is a bit wobbly, but the practical stuff looks incredible. It has aged exceptionally well. This movie is 10 years old now. And it has aged incredibly well. It looks great. It's really, really well done. Where it doesn't look like... It doesn't look like a rubber monster. It looks like, you know, whatever it is it's meant to be. You know, if it's like a orc or it's a... I don't want to get too spoilery. If it's, you know, something, it looks like it is that thing. Tying in with that, probably goes without saying, because this is one of Guillermo del Toro's fortes. He even did an exhibition about it once. But the monster designs in this movie are incredible. 
Oh my god, Guillermo, you knocked it out of the park for this movie. <laughs> Particularly, there is a character that they meet close to the end of the movie, so I'm not going to say who it is. I'll say it's a female character, I presume? I don't know if the, I don't think the character really has a gender. If you watch the movie, you'll probably know who it is. They're wearing a veil to begin with there. That's, that's vague enough, but you'll know who that is. So they're wearing a veil the first time you meet them. That design is incredible, in my opinion. A lot of them are great. There's a lot of uh, machinery things in this, so you get, like, these complex things unfolding. There's, like, machines that, like, you know, start as one thing and then turn into something else. Or transform, like the whole, like the hit motion picture Transformers. But kind of like that, and they're really well done. Thirdly, I think this film's got a quite enjoyable story. It's quite a fun kind of superhero movie. It's got that kind of plot progression you see in those kind of films. You see certain tropes of that genre come up, but they're all quite well done. It flows quite well. It's quite a fun, enjoyable little story, basically. Fourthly, I really like the cast in this. We get a little bit of John Hurt. We get some Ron Perlman. We get Doug Jones slash David Hyde Pierce. And I like them all, basically. They're all good at playing their parts. It's quite a fun little movie. I quite liked it. And lastly, I really like the fun transitions in this. This has the kind of fun, you know, a character walks behind a shelf or like a thing moves in front of a character. So say like a character slides a sliding door in front of them. As they slide the door across to slide the next scene we're going to watch across. It's quite simple and it's, you know, it's nothing like Groundbreaker or that, but I always really like them in movies. So I was happy to see them in this. For my cons, I've got one. I feel like the villain is maybe a bit underdeveloped. We don't really get much of him and his motivations outside of bad, you know, like I don't like humans. I, not human, me kill humans. You know, that's... It's alright. But I'd like a bit more about him. You know, maybe a bit more, like, why he's that vindictive. It doesn't damage the movie at all. It just feels like it could have been a bit better. For my overall rating, I gave this an 8 out of 10. Do I think you should see it? Yes. Watch Hellboy. Watch Hellboy 2. And then you can join me in the party of being sad that there isn't gonna, ever going to be a Hellboy 3. I know we're getting the reboot with David Harbour, but I really would have liked the Del Toro trilogy. These two movies both really impressed me, and it just is sad that there's not any more. They are really good. And not just the superhero movies, as movies as a whole. They are really good, really enjoyable movies. But I'll happily go and watch these again, and I think you should watch them, and just feel sad that there's not more. For my next film... On Wednesday the 27th of February, I watched Capote on Netflix, directed by Bennett Miller from 2005. For a plot summary, we follow Truman Capote as he works on a story about a family being murdered in Kansas. Again, no spoilers even for it's based on real life, so you could just look it up, but no spoilers. For my pros, firstly, Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance. He won an Academy Award for this. Philip Seymour Hoffman's a great actor. He has a very particular voice he has to do to play Truman Capote. Nails it the whole movie. And that's impressive. But it goes beyond that. He does a lot of really impressive acting in this. Like, a lot of emotions on display and really strongly. He he does a really good job in this. Tying in with that, I also quite like Clifton Collins Jr. who plays a character who I'm not going to reveal who he plays because I think that's kind of a spoiler maybe. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I would class it as a spoiler. You can watch If you watched it you'll know. I thought he was quite good in this. He's not as much to do as Philip Seymour Hoffman has but he has, a, he has a pretty good performance. Going on to my cons now, I've got one. The pacing for this movie felt really off to me. I felt like it was about to end and then it kept going and then Bits seemed to take too long and other bits were too short. It just, something about it was kind of strange. I can't quite place my finger on what it was. There's quite a few times I thought, well, that's the end of the movie. And then, because it did like a fade down to black, and then it came back up. And it stayed on black for quite a while. I don't know what they were going for stylistically with that. It just, it was strange to, it was like, you know, they were going to like cut out a certain ending, you know, like the endings earlier, depending what version of the film you go and see. But yeah, it was very strange, the pacing in this. 
I'm already on my overall rating now, so you're probably like, I've hardly said anything about Capote. There's not much to say. That's probably the worst kind of movie. That's probably one of the biggest flaws of it to me. <laughs> Is it's alright. You know? There's nothing outside of Philip Seymour Hoffman and like I said, Clifton Collins Jr. as well. There's nothing exceptionally great about it in my opinion. There's also nothing exceptionally bad about it except the pacing. So there's not much to talk about. It's, you know, everything else is good. But it's not spectacular. I'm not like, oh wow. You have to watch this movie to see the editing in Kabuji. So from my overall rating, I gave it a 7 out of 10. Do I think you should see it? I honestly don't really know how to answer that. Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance is really good. But I'm not sure if it's good enough to watch a whole movie. You know? It is an amazing performance by Philip Seymour Hoffman. But the movie itself was just... It didn't really click for me. On Thursday the 28th, I watched It's a Mad 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 World on Netflix. Created by Stanley Kramer from 1963. For a plot summary, in this farce, a group of characters race to a buried treasure of $350,000. Onto the pros. Firstly, I think this film is very funny. It's got a lot of quite fun jokes. I knew I was going to like it. There is a visual joke right at the beginning of the movie. Maybe about four minutes in. And that joke, I knew I was going to like it. Well, I say four minutes in. I should clarify. If you watch this on Netflix, for some reason it seems to open with the overture that would play in the cinema screening. Then you have the opening credits. Then there's an intermission. And then there's another overture after the movie's done. Bit strange. I'm just warning you, in case you do happen to go and watch this on Netflix, and you start and there's just five minutes of a black screen at the beginning with just the, a song playing, it's meant to be like that. Getting back on track, however, that opening visual gag really convinced me I'm going to enjoy this movie, and I did. It's very fun, very silly, and just an enjoyable experience. Secondly, I quite like the soundtrack for this. It's quite a fun caperish kind of almost clown-like music which kind of fits in with the silliness of the movie it, it's a it's the perfect score for this movie thirdly i think the cameos in this are quite fun this movie is quite famous for having quite a few cameos and i'm not going to say them all i'll just say two that are in the opening credits because i was looking out for them the whole movie i like buster keaton is in this for a little bit that's fun and you get the free stooges as well which is kind of fun Sort of tying into that, I think this film has a really good cast, actually. Everyone gives a really good comedic performance, I think. There's not a, anyone who gives a, a weak one. There's one person in particular I'm going to mention later on who gives a really strong one. But overall, this movie has a really good cast who do a really good job. Next, I think this film is really nicely filmed, especially for its age. I was quite impressed because often comedies are kind of, you know... Whatever, just jokes will do, and then everything else is kind of substandard. This film has like some really nice overhead shots. It has a lot of like crazy stunts with a whole car, basically a car chase aspect of it, because everyone's racing to get to this place where the treasure's buried. It has a lot more, you know, going on in it visually than a lot of comedies do. A lot of comedies are just kind of flat shot A, flat shot B, so we can hear have the two characters go, "Oh my god, he's." farted uh, that's funny i hate films like that i mentioned it earlier but the one member of the cast i really want to give a big shout out to ethel merman is in this as a domineering mother-in-law and she's brilliant she's really funny she might be my favorite character in it there's all characters that are really good in this but she is really funny in every scene she's in she's i know it's a bit of an old comedy stereotype the domineering mother-in-law but she does a really good job of it she is really really entertaining and lastly as a pro i really like the opening credits for this they're little animated opening credits of like a of like a little globe and like crazy things happening to it and i mentioned earlier i'm i'm a sucker for opening credits in a movie that aren't just text over the movie that are some sort of opening credits so i really enjoyed these ones and they fit quite well tonally with the movie because they're quite silly and madcap, which kind of sets up the movie that you're going to see. 
for my con for this movie it's maybe a bit too long this movie comes in at three hours 25 minutes not the version i watched uh three hours 25 really it's long i'll say that it is quite long it feels especially long for a comedy because usually most comedies will last about an hour and 30 or maybe an hour 40 if you're generous so to have one that goes for three three hours 25 really I'm certain the version I watched wasn't that long. It was definitely over two hours, I'm sure. Like, I think it was about 2.45. Three hours 25, wow. That's a long, that's a long movie. It's just something to keep in mind if you're going to watch it. It is quite long. But I think it's worth the, it's worth your time. It is, if you've got the time to sit and watch it, I think it's definitely worth a watch. For my overall rating, I gave It's a Mad Mad, Mad Mad World an 8 out of 10, which is two points for every mad in the title. I think it's a very good movie. It's a very fun movie. Do I think you should watch it? I kind of said this already, but yeah, I think you should if you have the type. Because it is quite long, but it's quite fun. I quite enjoyed it. It's quite silly, and I quite like farcical comedies. On Friday the 1st of March, 2019, my first film of month number three, yay, I watched Mr. Holmes on Amazon Prime, directed by Bill Condon from 2015. For a plot summary, an ageing Sherlock Holmes lives in retirement. He tries to write about his last case while battling dementia. For my pros, firstly, Ian McKellen's performance. Now he is playing Sherlock Holmes in this, and he's great. That probably doesn't surprise people who have seen Ian McKellen, because he's a very good actor. But one thing I want to mention in particular, so we are primarily in the 30s, like the 1930s, where he's 92, I think, Sherlock Holmes at that point. He's, you know, in retirement in Sussex with his bees, or is it Essex? I think it's Sussex. I don't know, I can't mind. But, you know, he's, he becomes like a beekeeper in his retirement. That's an actual thing in Sherlock Holmes stories. He becomes a beekeeper. Spoilers for Sherlock Holmes. So we cut from him in the 30s to him, I think it's 20 years earlier, when he's going over his last case and he physically acts completely differently in both time periods because it's not a younger person playing younger Sherlock Holmes he's playing young old Sherlock Holmes and old old Sherlock Holmes and he does both perfectly like you believe he has aged 20 years between the flashbacks and the present of the movie he is amazing in this it probably isn't surprising to people but that in particular, I think, deserves recognition. Like even his facial expressions, as the way he walks, the way he talks, the way he just kind of acts. You know, his physicality of him. Everything's different in that, like between flashback and present, and that's really impressive to pull off. Did a really good job on this, did Ian McKellen. For my second pro, I think Milo Parker, who plays the son of the housekeeper, who he kind of befriends. He's pretty good in this, actually. Not too much to say about his performance, just thought he's pretty good. Thirdly, I think this film has a lot of really well done emotional moments. The whole dementia aspect is really well done. It's probably a bit upsetting for a lot of people. I don't like dementia stuff. It's kind of it's kind of my worst nightmare would be having dementia. I'm terrified of it. I'm terrified of it and I'm 25. So I've got a long way to go before that even becomes a possibility for me, hopefully. But I'm terrified of them. Don't like dementia. This movie though has a lot of like sad moments. Has quite a few nice happy moments as well. It's just it's just quite a nice movie. Onto my con, I've got one for this movie. I think the actual mystery of the movie is really lacking and is it's kind of obvious, I think. Like I worked out pretty quickly what went on with the last case, because he can't remember. That's like the whole kind of plot of the movie, is him trying to remember what happened in that case to write about it. And I thought it was super obvious and I worked out quite quickly. But it doesn't hinder the movie too much because the mystery isn't really the focus, I'd say. It's more about the it's more about the emotions. <laughs> Sounds a bit corny, but it is, you know. It's more about him dealing with dementia and, you know, dealing with not being able to remember stuff. For my overall rating, I gave Mr. Holmes a 9 out of 10. I really enjoyed this movie quite a lot. Do I think you should see it? Yeah, I think you should. 
I really enjoyed it. And I think you would enjoy it too, hopefully. It's worth watching just for Ian McKellen, to be honest. He's brilliant in it. Oh, here we go. God. Just looking at it, I'm like, no, I don't want to. For my last film this week, for my bad film, I watched Ega on Amazon Prime, directed by Nicholas Merriweather. That's in big inverted commas, because it's actually directed by Arch Hall Sr., and I'm going to call him that throughout the, throughout the discussion. And this movie's from 1965. Did I say I watched it on Amazon Prime? I did, because of course I did. All the crap movies are on Amazon Prime. It's worth getting Amazon Prime for unlimited crap movies. <laughs> for a plot summary, a prehistoric giant stalks a young lady. Also, there's some musical numbers. Yes, Ega, the movie about a prehistoric caveman giant, is also a musical. I don't know either. For the pros, well, I actually do know, and I'll get into that. Uh, yeah, I'll get into that later on. For my pros... This movie had one laugh out of me. In fact, sorry, no, it had two laughs out of me. First, at the beginning, where we first see Ega, like this. So our cast kind of consists of Ega, who's the caveman. We have Archhall Jr., who's male lead, I guess. He's not much of a protagonist. That's one of the cons. We'll get into that later on. We have Archhall Sr. as dad. And we have Lady... Marilyn Manning as female. Roxy, that's her name. Every time I forget the girlfriend's name. Because, right? I'm just going to quickly bring this up because I don't. Did I mention this? Oh, I do mention this later. Never mind. We'll get to it later. So, the first time you meet Ega, Roxy's driving her car and she's driving her car along the road and then suddenly Ega jumps out in front of the car. And it was such a sudden non sequitur. Just, you know, lady driving car, nothing remotely caveman related before this suddenly Ega and I was like what <laughs> it's such a non sequitur like, I knew this movie was about a caveman and it still took me by surprise so that made me laugh and secondly there's a dubbed line apparently this movie was covered by Mystery Science Theater 3000 and apparently they took this line and made it a joke because of course they did there's a line in this where uh, dad when they're going into the desert to look for Ega goes uh, oh yeah, we need to go over here. And then dubbed in really loudly just, Watch out for snakes! And it's so loud. And it's so abrupt. That made me laugh. There's also no snakes. There's, you don't even see stock footage of a snake. Now on to the many, 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 many cons of Ega. Firstly, this is one of the most boring films I've ever watched. I couldn't get over how boring this film was. I feel like five things happen in the space of one hour and 30 minutes. It is slow... It is boring. I was kind of taken aback because I thought, caveman movie, that might be not boring. But no, it's boring and bad. For my second con, our rubbish protagonist. So now we need to have a conversation about Arch Hall Jr. And you may have noticed this film was directed by Arch Hall Sr. So in the story and in the billing of the movie, Arch Hall Jr. is meant to be the main character because he's the top build actor in the movie. And he is the worst protagonist I've ever seen in any movie. So, at one point, the dad and the daughter are taken to Ega's cave. And during that long sequence, they spend about 40 minutes with Ega and lay him in the cave. And we'll get, every so often, we'll cut to Archel Jr. in the desert just going... I just realised that's an that's a audio thing. <laughs> I just did a physical action in an audio-only video. But he's just walking about, and he goes, Roxy! And then we cut back to the cave. He gets punched by Ega all the time. He gets, you know, Ega makes him look like a wimp, basically. He gets, he gets, Roxy gets stole off him at the end by some other guy until he hugs her after Ega dies. <laughs> Spoilers, guys. I know you're, I know you're very emotionally invested in Ega, but yeah, he dies in the end. It's very tragic. He's a terrible protagonist. Thirdly, this film has terrible footage quality. Now, I usually don't mention it for old films. This might just be because the one that's uploaded on Amazon Prime might be a low-quality print. But this movie's in colour, and the one I watched was nearly black and white. I actually had to stop it, get someone else to come and look at it, and tell me if it was in colour or not. It's completely desaturated. It's really hard to see stuff. 
particularly when they're in the cave, I'm a bit like, what's going on here? It's pretty bad. And like I said, it might just be the public domain film can that someone's uploaded to Prime Video. It's pretty, it's pretty shoddy. But again, that could just be the, the age of it. Maybe, maybe the original looks brilliant. I don't think it does, going off everything else, but maybe it does. And the budget. This movie apparently had like no budget basically. For my next con, I've got the songs and I've done a little squiggly in my face. This is when I'm going to bring up. I've got this as a con later on, but I'm just going to bring this up now. So, this whole movie is Arch Hall Jr.'s. No, excuse me. Arch Hall Sr.'s attempt to make Arch Hall Jr. a Elvis style movie slash music star. So we get a lot of songs that are, you know, just forced into the movie in really unnatural ways. Like they go to a party and him him and his band, they really swing. Like they're at the... <laughs> I just think about all his dialogue as well. All his dialogue is really... It feels like it's written by like a 50-year-old man trying to sound cool. It's all like kind of like 50s cool words as well. I know it's 62, but it still feels kind of dated. <laughs> But the songs, we have to get to the songs, the songs in this movie. One of the things that annoys me the most about them is he sings two songs before we encounter Iga, really. Or like, they encounter Iga properly. And they are Valerie and Vicky. His girlfriend's called Roxy. And like, would it have killed you to rewrite one of them to be Roxy? Or to rewrite the movie and call the movie Rock? Or like, rewrite the movie? Rewrite the... You rewrite the movie and call the character Vicky or Valerie. Because I thought maybe this is going to lead up to the third song. You know, the last song you'll sing will be Roxy. And then that's when she realises, oh, I really love him. I'm not in love with Ega. That's actually the caveman's name. I don't think I ever established that. <laughs> that's his name, is Ega. That's why it's called that. I just noticed this movie is listed as a comedy on IMDb. And there are, jo- there are jokes in this and they are terrible. Oh, that's my next call but we're jumping ahead. The next con is the terrible comedy. I never laughed once at an intentional joke. They're all, oh boy, they are bad. They are really, really bad. For my next con, the badly dubbed dialogue. So looking up the trivia for this, apparently they didn't record a lot of the audio, so they had to dub it in later. It's really bad. That's why we get the, watch our first mix line. There's, in particular, we get Iga. He has a scene where we are zoomed, so we only see his face. His mouth is closed. And we get like, That's how he talks the whole movie. It really wears Finn after like about five minutes. And he's on the screen for a lot. So all the dubbing dialogue is really bad. And there's a lot of it. And it's, it really, really makes for a bad movie. For my next con, this is something that really annoyed me. So they escape e- Ega's cave, they get in their dune buggy, they drive away, and it's like, okay, the movie's over. And there was 30 minutes left. 30 minutes left. Because you see, you see, Roxy. Every time I have to think of her name, because he sang two songs that weren't her name. Anyway, Roxy left a pair of trousers in Ega's cave, and he sniffs them. And from the trousers, I think, I think the trousers actually, I'm not entirely sure. But from them... He is then able to perfectly pinpoint where she is across a desert and track her down like like he's a dog. I just remembered one of the jokes as a drunk guy sees him, right? So a drunk guy sees him and then his wife is like, you're drinking too much? And he's like, no, I'm not. And then he sees Ega and the wife doesn't. And then he goes to the wife and he's like, here's the keys. I've drank too much. And you're like, oh my God, what, what a joke. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. Because my last con, I kind of mentioned this, this is like a pure ego trip for the Arch Hall Senior slash Arch Hall Junior. It feels very much like Arch Hall Senior is the driving force between the Arch Hall Junior attempted star making. It feels like Arch Hall Senior fancied being the manager of a high profile, you know, star and getting a massive cut of Arch Hall Junior's money if he became a star, you know? One of those deals. I wasn't impressed with this movie at all. For my overall rating, I gave it a 0 out of 10. Do I think you should watch it? No. 
Not, it's not even notable for seeing Richard Keel, who'd go on to play Jaws and James Bond. Even that doesn't make it worthwhile watching. Maybe it's worth watching if you watch the Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode of it, but I don't count that as watching this movie. That's watching an episode of a TV show that happens to have a, this movie in it. This movie is bad. Don't watch it. That's every movie for this week done. I know what you're thinking. Mild, what are you watching on Sunday the 3rd of March? I'm going to watch Nocturnal Animals. I hope I enjoy that. What was my movie for the week? We have two strong contenders in Mr. Holmes and Get Out. But Get Out definitely pips it to the post. Like, Mr. Holmes is a good movie. But it's probably a great movie. And Get Out is an excellent movie. Don't think there's anything else to say at the end of this episode. So, there's nothing else to say. But I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like if you did. Subscribe. Leave comments with film suggestions because I'm creating a big list of them and about to go on a big DVD shopping spree. That's going to be fun. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye. God, that means I need to do that again.